Hi folks! This presentation is basically about repetitive DNA, also called redundant DNA. It's a major feature of eukaryotic genomes, though much less so in prokaryotes. We'll talk a lot about transposons, a kind of repetitive DNA that you may know as jumping genes. Repetitive DNA sequences, especially transposons, were once called junk DNA because they seemed to serve no genetic or physiological function and transposons were also once called selfish DNA because their replication seemed to have no biological purpose other than their own spread and self-perpetuation. They have played a major role in evolution, shaping, and I mean literally shaping, eukaryotic genomes, including our own. Let's begin with a description of the experiments of Britton and Davidson. Let me tell you what these guys found. They started with the idea that there must be some DNA sequences in a eukaryotic genome that were in fact redundant. As examples, they could point to the genes that encode ribosomal RNAs. These were known to be repeated. To this, they could add DNA sequences near multiple different genes encoding different proteins, but that had to be turned on or off at the same time by interacting with the same regulatory factors. Also, the phenomenon of jumping genes had really been reported prior to Britton and Davidson's work. Britton and Davidson's results basically were that typical eukaryotic genomes turn out to be rich in redundant sequences. In addition to the basic double helical complementary DNA structure that we've seen, here's what we knew about DNA around the time Britton and Davidson began their work. Cesium chloride density gradient centrifugation separates eukaryotic DNA fragments into a main band of typical DNA density and a smaller satellite band of greater or lesser density depending on species. In many cases, the satellite DNA was shown by base composition analysis to contain a higher proportion of the bases adenine and thymine compared to the main band DNA. For a few species, the satellite DNA was richer in guanine and cytosine. As we've already noted, there was the expectation that some DNA sequences were, by their nature, redundant. So here's the basic experiment. DNA is fragile and shears naturally during extraction. But high molecular weight extracts could be made to shear to more uniform size fragments, say 10 kilobase pair fragments like those illustrated here. The expedient is really very simple. You take the high molecular weight DNA that you've extracted and you force it under constant pressure through a fine gauge needle or at the end of a syringe. And that will shear the DNA down to pretty much uniform lengths. The sheared fragments were then heated to 100 degrees Celsius to break the hydrogen bonds and separate or denature the DNA strands. Then the mixture was cooled to 60 degrees to allow separated strands to find and reanneal to their complements. And that's pretty much what I just said, isn't it? This curve shows the rate of the formation or reformation of double-stranded DNA fragments at 60 degrees when this experiment was done with rat DNA extracts. Time on the x-axis is in log units, so the data actually taken over days, or even weeks, could fit on this graph. The data is multiphasic, as if there were three classes of rat DNA based on how rapidly each class could reform double strands after they'd been denatured. Let's talk about what these classes or groups of DNA could be. Imagine in a tube full of rat DNA fragments that 15 to 20 percent of the DNA in the tube consists of many copies of the same sequence. About 25 to 40 percent of the DNA consists of sequences that are repeated but less so than the fastest annealing fraction, that is to say the moderately redundant or repetitive sequences. The remaining DNA, a much smaller percentage overall, taking the longest time to find their complements, must then be sequences that are unique or repeated only a few times in the genome and therefore they anneal or renature much later. In fact, we can think of a tube full of eukaryotic DNA fragments as consisting of a pretty high concentration of highly repeated sequences that find each other and reanneal pretty quickly, followed by a large fraction 
of moderately repeated DNA and a very small, relatively speaking, small fraction or small concentration of unique sequence DNA or nearly unique sequence DNA. The bottom line here, repeated DNA sequences are indeed a large proportion of the eukaryotic genome. The curve shown here is the reassociation kinetics of extracted fragmented bacterial DNA. The curve showing the reassociation kinetics of extracted bacterial DNA consists only of one class of DNA. But is this class repetitious DNA? Asking this question is like asking whether all of the DNA in a bacterial genome, whether all of that DNA is in fact repeated so that the circle consists of two copies of each gene or three copies of each gene. We know from gene mapping studies that the E. coli genes are located, they map, one after the other on the circular chromosome and in fact there's only one copy of each gene per genome. So what this curve is really telling us is that prokaryotic DNA has few if any repeated sequence DNA fragments. That shouldn't be surprising since the prokaryotic genome is pretty small containing not much more DNA than is actually needed to encode the genes required for survival. Here's the evidence. Ah, I meant to ask this as a question but I've already given you the answer. That's okay. So here's a graph with two curves on it. For each time point at which the concentration of reannealed or double-stranded DNA was measured, that time was multiplied by the measured double-stranded DNA concentration. This concentration times time or cot value becomes the x-axis of this curve. So-called cot curves reveal the complexity of a genome. Genomic complexity is defined as the proportion of a genome that is unique, moderately repeated, or highly repeated. Cut curves permit comparison of the complexity of different genomes on the same graph, placing unique sequence DNA from any source at the right with a high cut value, and progressively more repetitious DNA lies to the left of the slow annealing DNA sequences. So from this curve, you can say that the bacterial genome is 100% unique sequence, while well, the rat genome has all three classes of DNA, unique, moderately repeated, and highly repeated. This is an attempt to help you understand the cot curve, and I will confess right up front that I had a lot of trouble in my youth figuring out what exactly was going on. So let's see if this is a decent explanation. What you're looking at is a renaturation kinetic experiment on two samples of sheared E. coli DNA. One sample started at a concentration of, a one, of one milligram per mil, and the other started at two milligrams per mil, and you get two curves as shown on the graph. So the question is, which of these two curves is the data from the two milligram per mil sample, and which is from the one milligram per mil sample? The answer is that the curve at the left is from the two milligram per mil sample. I'll leave it to you to think about it and explain why the curve on the left comes from the higher concentration sample. So now this graph shows the cot curves for both the one milligram per mil and the two milligram per mil renaturation kinetic data. Remember that the cot value is the concentration of the double-stranded DNA that has formed at a given time point multiplied by that time point. It may not be entirely intuitive, but the result is that the data from the two experiments are superimposable. It looks like there's only one curve. That makes sense since bacterial DNA is made up of unique sequence DNA whether you start with two milligrams per mil, one milligram per mil, or ten milligrams per mil. So I hope that kind of gives you an idea of why cut data allows you to superimpose the data, renaturation kinetic data, from two or more different samples or sources of DNA. So what can we say from all this? Prokaryotic genomes are largely composed of unique or non-repetitive sequence DNA, most of which are genes that encode proteins, along with genes that encode ribosomal RNAs and transfer RNAs. But what's the situation in eukaryotes? Just what kinds of DNA are actually repeated and what kinds are unique? You would expect perhaps that satellite DNA and ribosomal RNAs and the transposable elements which we mentioned before, which were all known to exist by the late 1960s, 
you might expect them to belong to one of the repetitive DNA classes. Well, here's what you can do with renaturation experiments that enables you to ask those questions. These kinetic experiments actually allow you to separate the cot fractions. The high cot, meaning the unique material, the middle cot, and the low cot. The fractions off the different regions of our graph. Once you separate them, you can actually do experiments that allow you to determine whether a given cot fraction contains one or another of these kinds of genes. Ribosomal RNA genes, tRNA genes, for example, satellite DNA, and other sequences. Later, with the advent of recombinant DNA technology, it became possible to determine the redundancy level of any gene that you could clone. So let me tell you briefly how these kinds of experiments might have been done. So you can get, say, ribosomal RNA itself, which is a large percentage of the RNA in a cell, and you could make it radioactive. If you then mix it with highly repeated DNA, middle repeated DNA, or unique fractions of DNA that have been heated to 100 degrees to separate the, the double-stranded DNA, and then allowed to cool in the presence of the ribosomal RNA, which has been made radioactive, you would be asking which DNA fraction will form an RNA-DNA double strand, an RNA-DNA hybrid, using ribosomal RNA. You could even do the same thing with satellite DNA, which just comes right off of the cesium chloride gradient, make it radioactive, mix it with denatured, high re highly repetitive, middle repetitive, and unique fraction DNA, and see which one it would form a radioactive double strand with. So let's take a look at the results. So the genes for proteins turn out to hybridize only to the unique DNA that takes a long time to anneal and, and are found in the high cut value fractions. Ribosomal RNA genes, and by the way also transposons, can be shown to hybridize to moderately repeated DNA, the middle value cut fractions. Short repeated AT rich regions, that's adenosine and, and thymine rich regions, and satellite DNAs, which can be repeated up to 100,000 to a million times, they hybridized to the low cut value fraction, that is to say, to the highly repeated DNA fraction. So what do we know about repeated DNA behavior or function? So we've identified satellite DNAs, we say they're highly repeated. Now we know about ribosomal RNAs, they hybridize to the moderately repetitive region. So what do we know about repeated DNA behavior or its function? Let's take a look. Microsatellite sequences, these are very highly repeated and they're associated with centromeres. They're also a major part of heterochromatin. In centromeres, they help to form the kinetic core during mitosis and meiosis. So microsatellite DNA has a function, apparently, uh, to anchor microtubules on the spindle fiber to help pull the chromatids apart during either mitosis or meiosis. There are many satellite sequences. These are sequences that are a bit longer than microsatellites, but also highly repeated. They are spread out in the genome, so they don't focus on one part of the genome. They don't code for anything, and in fact, most are of unknown function. Um, one exception may be sequences in the telomeres, and we already know the telomeres serve to maintain chromosome length during mitosis. An interesting thing about mini satellites is we each have different numbers of uh, these mini satellites, and because we have different numbers, we can use them for DNA fingerprinting. Okay, so I said transposons are repeated. They repeat because they can copy themselves and jump into many, often random, sites in the genome. And it turns out that transposons are part of the middle repetitive or middle cut value uh, DNA. So here's a table that summarizes the types and some characteristics of repetitive DNAs. Now this is very small. I don't expect you to look at this and stare at it uh, in, in a classroom. but Please look at it and you can compare transposable elements, ribosomal RNA genes, transcribed genes, the introns of genes, the DNA between genes, and satellite DNAs. Those are the major types shown here. And the table shows you which of these categories of, of uh, DNA are highly repetitive, moderately repetitive, or, or more or less unique. It gives you some examples. And 
uh, tells you some functions where we know. And with that, we reach the end of this presentation.